One of the issues that working people face in this country is that many of the illnesses that we have and sicknesses are actually caused by uh, our occupations. And yet, uh, workers have to struggle to get compensation in health care for that. And we're talking about millions of people who are contaminated, refinery workers, all kinds of workers. And you have to prove uh, that you've been actually ill and sickened by that particular industry. And that's another reason we need national health care, so that everyone is covered regardless of where they get sick or and how they get sick. And our next speaker is Adam Wood. He's with uh, Firefighters Local 798. He's also with the Firefighting Cancer Foundation, and they have been fighting to protect injured firefighters who are made ill as a result of their job, and it's been a struggle uh, to make sure that they get properly taken care of when they get sick from the work that they do. So welcome, Adam. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, my name's Adam Wood. I'm a member of the executive board of San Francisco Firefighters Local 798, and I also work at Station 7, which is on 19th Street and uh, Folsom in the Mission District in San Francisco. You know, despite uh, significant advances in protective gear, more extensive use of breathing apparatus to protect us from smoke at fires, it, firefighting is still an extremely dangerous profession. In fact, last year, 2013, was the worst year for fire ground deaths since 2001, since the World Trade Center collapse. Uh, it was particularly hard in Texas. There was, just as Steve mentioned, there was the uh, West Texas uh, chemical uh, explosion that uh, killed 11 volunteer and professional firefighters who were responding to the initial fire when the chemical plant exploded and destroyed the town. And just about a month and a half later, after that, and on uh, May 30th, four firefighters in Houston died at a motel fire. And just another month after that, in Arizona, some of you may remember, 19 wildland firefighters were killed when the winds shifted suddenly on them in Arizona. So it was a, it was a particularly bad year for firefighter deaths. This year's already started off tough. Uh, there were two firefighters that were killed in Toledo, January 25th. And just two months after that, in Boston, two firefighters just died firing, uh, fighting a large fire in the Back Bay neighborhood of Boston. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's still a dangerous job. And uh, when these deaths happen on the fire ground, as firefighters, we usually react you know, with intense grief at the loss of life and uh, you know, concern for the loved ones and families that, that are left behind. Generally, the culture of this job is we don't respond with a lot of outrage at these fire ground deaths. It's sort of, in, you know, considered part of the job and, you know, something that all of us may face. And uh, it, that may or may not be a healthy attitude, but that's, that's kind of traditionally the way firefighters have responded to fire ground deaths. The chemical explosion in West Texas might be an exception to that rule. That was somewhat outrageous. But what has been provoking outrage in firefighters across the country over the past 10 years or so has been the epidemic rise of off-duty deaths related to job-related cancers uh, higher, at a higher rate than we've ever experienced in the past. And in San Francisco, uh, this issue has kind of come to our attention since 2006 when we founded our San Francisco Firefighters Cancer Prevention Foundation. The union founded it basically at the instigation of a retired firefighter, uh, Captain Tony Stefani, who contracted a rare pelvic cancer that forced him into retirement. Uh, that he had no understanding of how he could have possibly contracted. He's this uh, Tony Stefani. If you ever meet him, he's a uh, obsessive health nut. You know, triathlete. Uh, watches what he eats. Don't get into a conversation about health with him because you're trapped for an hour and a half. <laughs> So there was no, he couldn't understand what, how he could have possibly got exposed to this cancer. And right about the same time that Tony was fighting his cancer, five other firefighters from the exact same firehouse that Tony worked at, all about Tony's age, came down with the same rare form of pelvic cancer. So once Tony was able to defeat the cancer and get back to his life, he was driven to find out why did this happen, 
you know, why this cluster and what could be done about it. And so that's why he helped, he came to us and said, let's launch this Cancer Prevention Foundation. So initially what the foundation did is Tony working with the doctor that he worked with at UCSF, Dr. Marshall Stoller, set up a series of screenings for active and retired firefighters to make sure that none of them had cancers they didn't already know about. And then they also did a survey where over 700 active and, re and re uh, retired firefighters responded of anyone that was currently facing cancer that they did know about. And the numbers we got back from the survey were unbelievable. We got uh, 270 people were, fight were actively fighting cancer at that time of the just over 700 people who responded, which was wow. just San Francisco firefighters. And this is not a huge fire department. I mean, there's about 1,300 of us. 270 had active cancer not in remission at the time of that survey. And unfortunately, since that time, of that initial group combined with others who have contracted cancer since the surveys began, we've actually lost 231 active and retired firefighters to, to cancers just since we started doing these surveys in 2007. So all these firefighters that were fighting cancer also, besides fighting the cancer, just as Steve was mentioning, had to fight the city's workers' compensation system and the retirement board to determine that the cancer was work-related. And this is, firefighters have a little leg up on a lot of other workers in that there are state cancer presumption laws for firefighters. Despite the presence of these laws, the way they were being applied still put all the burden on the firefighter to prove that they, conduct, they contracted their cancer through the job and so that you'd get this regular occurrence of off-duty firefighters coming into the firehouse, going through five years worth of journals to document every single fire they went to because they had to submit that to workers' comp. They'd have to get second medical opinions. They'd have to prove that it couldn't have been contracted off-duty. If you were ever a smoker, you had a huge uphill battle trying to prove that it was a work-related cancer. Um, and all this while you're going through chemotherapy, while you're going through radiation. There was an article on March 25th in the Chronicle, some of you may have read it, about one of our members, Denise Elarms, who was fighting breast cancer and the workers' compensation system. And Denise had a particularly virulent form of breast cancer that required repeated treatments. She lost her short-term memory. I worked with Denise when she first came into the fire department. She was a very strong, willful, willful person, totally capable of sticking up for herself. And working with her through this whole process, she just, there's no way she could get through this bureaucracy without help because of the damage the cancer and the treatment combined had on her. So it was a tremendous burden on these folks to try to get the job determined, to be, get the cancer work related. And then if they were forced into retirement by the cancer, early retirement, or even worse, if they passed away and their families had to go to the retirement board to try to get some kind of a pension uh, the same process began again in the retirement board, the same obstacles, the same hurdles to jump over. So, um, so it was a struggle. While all that was going on, the incredible rate of cancer among firefighters in San Francisco attracted the attention of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. They contacted us with the intent of conducting the most comprehensive long-term study of urban firefighters and cancer that had ever been conducted. So they worked closely with our Cancer Prevention Foundation and did a study of San Francisco, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Firefighters from the dates ranging from 1950 to 2009. No study like this had ever been conducted before. And what they found was what our everyday experience was telling us, that firefighters have an elevated risk versus the general population of 12 different cancers, 12 specific different cancers, significantly elevated rate versus the general population. So that confirmed what we had all been experiencing. It's not our imagination. This really is related to the job that we have. And uh, at the same time that this research was going on, there was an interesting investigative uh, reporting project going on by a group of Chicago Tribune reporters that shed a little light on why this increased rate of cancer was happening now, what might a possible cause to this increased rate of cancer. And ironically, what they found was that it is very likely caused by the fire retardant chemicals in today's furniture that are meant to diminish fires. 
And I won't go into the, there's, there's a lot of details to what they uncovered. If you guys ever get a chance, there's a HBO documentary called The Toxic Hot Seat that uh, premiered in November of 2013. It was directed by Jamie Redford, Robert Redford's son. And it's a really, really interesting look at this whole story from when they first got information following all the way through. But in a nutshell, what it turned out was in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, the tobacco industry was taking a lot of uh, heat for uh, all of the deaths related to smoking in bed. And so what they ended up doing was forming an alliance with the chemical companies and spun the argument where it's not the cigarette that's the problem, it's the bed. If the bed doesn't catch on fire, the smoking's not a problem. And uh, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but they put, a, they put millions of dollars into scientific studies, lobbying, advertising campaigns, setting up community front groups that were completely financed by the chemical companies to lobby state, local, and federal government to require that fire retardant chemicals be added to all furniture in the United States. And um, just like, you know, with textbooks, if you want to change textbook curriculum, you've got to change the standards in Texas. You know that whole story. For furniture, it's California. If you change the requirements in California, all the furniture manufacturers want a piece of this market, and they're all going to adapt to the changing regulations in California. So that's what they targeted, and they achieved it. Later, as it turns out, the, even the lead scientists who conducted the initial studies that promoted this idea of flame retardants repudiated the initial studies. The science was bad. Uh, they're not effective in preventing fire. So what, what the result is is that we've got pounds of these chemicals per piece of furniture that are extremely poisonous and are not effective in stopping fire. Well, but delay the, the delay the of the second. 30 seconds. And if it's only in the foam and not in the fabric, even that doesn't really make a difference. So, so and the result for us as firefighters is when we go into a, a, a home where that's, or even an office that's full of this furniture, not only are we confronted with smoke containing carbon monoxide and the soot that we were facing for years, but it's this toxic soup of carcinogenic chemicals that doesn't even need to penetrate through respiration. It penetrates through skin absorption. So even our, even our you know, modern breathing apparatus aren't helping us uh, stay protected from these chemicals. Um, and then the other issue is, you know, we're sort of the canaries in the coal mine. We're, we've got this initial intense exposure to the burning chemicals when they're at their worst, but everyone's exposed to these chemicals. Uh, since from 1970 to 2004, blood levels of these fire retardants have doubled in all adults in the United States, and it's worse in kids because just like lead paint, as the chemicals decay, they go into a dust or powder form, settle on the floor right where the kids are. So it's it's uh, it's an environmental hazard not just for firefighters but for everybody. It's it's huge in breast milk. Yeah. So anyway, going forward, what we've done uh, fighting this cancer issue, we're kind of fighting it now on two fronts. We've we've uh, joined a coalition of environmental organizations, um, other firefighters from around the country, local and state politicians that have developed an awareness of this uh, uh, fire retardant issue. And we've uh, been testifying before the state government. We've been, uh, Tony Stefani, the founder of our Cancer Prevention Foundation, testified before Senate, the Senate in Washington uh, on a panel with these chemical companies. And uh, we've been making some headway. Now, uh, under uh, the current administration in Sacramento, the companies are no longer required to include the fire retardants, but it's voluntary. They can. They can, they can or cannot include the fire retardants in California furniture. And the chemical companies are pushing back even on that very small victory. Also in Washington, the chemical companies are pushing bi uh, bills that will make it really difficult for localities to, raise, uh, to get rid of these uh, um, uh, chemicals and to make more restrictions against these chemicals in their furniture. So we've got an uphill battle, but it's continuing right now on that front. Locally on the workers' comp front, this NIOSH study has actually made an impact on the current head of cities, the city's workers' comp division, a woman named Peggy Sugarman. She's met with us. She met with the lead researcher on that study, and she said based on what she's seen in that study for, for firefighters, a medical diagnosis of cancer and four years on the job is all you need to have for them to determine the cancer to be work-related. So that's a, 
we're going to have to see if they follow up on that. But that, 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 was, that was just recently, since the, the studies come out. Um, right now, we had a rally on March 26th at City Hall where we laid out 20, 231 pairs of boots for all the people we've lost to cancer and had 200 firefighters come out and form, have a big rally uh, at City Hall. And uh, David Chu, the president of the Board of Supervisors, is going to introduce legislation to extend that same approach to cancer presumption to the city's retirement board for firefighters so that you won't have that set of hoops to jump through if you're forced into retirement or your family needs to collect if you pass away. So, uh, so we're gonna be following the progress of that bill. So those are small victories. I think that we're gonna keep following up on the chemical issue and the local workers comp issues for firefighters. I, in my opinion, the next step is gonna to have to be Fire, we as firefighters are going to have to look beyond just the family of firefighters to the family of labor because we're all subject to these chemicals, you know, and uh, cancer on the job is not, is not acceptable for any profession. So, you know, we've got, as firefighters, politicians like the occasional photo op with firefighters, and we don't have a lot of economic weight. We're not like a huge, a, a large union. But, we, but uh, we have a little bit of political influence. We've got to be able to uh, leverage that influence to help other unions that might not have the same political weight that we do, but are subject to the same kind of hazards that we're, because it, it's all about improving the environment for everybody. So that, that's, a, that's another step that the firefighters, I think, need to make both locally and around the country. There's actually, actually the International Association of uh, Firefighters just launched a national survey uh, of uh, a study of suicide amongst firefighters or indicators of suicide. It was a voluntary participation. We had a number of members from San Francisco participate. People around the country took part in the study. So it'll be interesting to see what the results of that are. But that's, that's something that's going along the lines of mental health on the job. Uh, we've also, in San Francisco, developed a really active, although extremely small and under-supported stress unit that, uh, that uh, deals with uh, a whole variety of issues related to on-the-job stress, both uh, in terms of uh, substance addiction, suicidality, uh, depression. Yeah, it's, it's a basic, it's like a peer counseling service that refers, makes the initial contact with, with firefighters that are feeling these issues and can refer them to professional health, especially professional help that's got experience working with firefighters and that type of... Uh, Workplace, so that's that's one thing that it's good that we have, but it needs to be developed uh, and supported better than it is. It's basically two guys right now for 1,200 people. And what they, yeah, I mean, just they'll set up a group of supposed firefighters advocating for these fire retardants, and you just scratch under the surface, none of them are firefighters, and they, and they just they, nothing happens. They, oh, sorry, yeah, I guess we're wrong. We didn't know. Here's the next group, you know, and so I mean, it really. They're evil. Yeah, they're evil. I mean, yeah. SFFCPF.org. SFFCPF.org. San Francisco Firefighters Cancer Prevention Foundation.